Well, hello, everybody. It's Heath Robinson with Topaz Labs back again with the one and only John Barclay to present day two of Crafting Your Images with Topaz Studio. It's an in-depth look at John's favorite tools from Topaz and how he uses those to enhance his workflows. I am here. Thank you, Heath, and thank you for everyone for showing up. I just need to do some housework here to make sure we show my screen, and Heath is going to tell me that he can see my Lightroom screen now. Yep, you're good. Fabulous. Okay, so thanks for those who are coming back today. We appreciate uh, the great attendance yesterday. It was a record attendance. <clears throat> right now, it looks like people are just scrambling to get in as we get started today. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, what we're going to do today is continue pretty much where we left off. If you're just coming in today and didn't participate yesterday, fear not. Uh, we're going to do a, a few reviews here to cement some concepts to start. I received some great emails from some people wanting me to clarify, and I think it's a good thing to do to start, and then we'll add some concepts to what we did yesterday. So again, remember, if you're new and just showing up, uh, you'll have yesterday's recording uh, in the email that you receive in a couple of hours, as uh, Heath just spoke about, and you'll be able to get caught up by watching that first video and then re-watching this one if you need to to cement those concepts. It's, it's a great capability that you have by just registering. It's why you should always register, because even if you end up that you can't make it to a webinar, you can see it uh, and you get a link right away to the raw video. <clears throat> okay, so um, the questions here that we have. Arvid wrote to me and the question was about, it really wasn't a question, it was, a, it was, there was a question about how to save with all the layers, but the other point was to just clarify, if we're going to be using AI Clear that we spoke about yesterday and that I adore so much, I called it revolutionary and I mean that. We're, uh, Heath and I were just speaking about it and I, I can't stop gushing about that piece of software. And so we'll, we'll go ahead and introduce it again here. And just to make things go a little quick, more quickly, um, I'm gonna go right into uh, Topaz Adjust, but. I'm sorry, Topaz Studio. Wow, that's a that's a Fortean stuff. That's how I met the folks at Topaz was way back with Topaz Adjust, which was their first major product many, 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 many years ago. But when when we're invoking a, a tool, what I want to show you is if I go to the raw file here and I'm in Lightroom, let's say, because we're using that as our front end, it's important that you understand that if you're going to use AI Clear. The folks at Topaz tell us that it's best to turn, turn off any sharpening or any noise reduction. So here I am over here on the right side. I'm in uh, Lightroom here and I'm in the develop module and I'm looking at my sharpening and noise reduction. I'm gonna make those nothing, zero them out. Because the algorithms that are happening in the artificial intelligence work better, and, and maybe this is a good way to put it, sometimes get confused if we add sharpening or if we add noise reduction outside of what AI Clear is supposed to be doing. So we'll go in, I've already opened this up with those settings there. So we have an edited image from Lightroom because I, that's my choice. Again, you can use uh, Topaz as a standalone and not invoke anything from any, uh, you don't have to purchase a monthly subscription from Adobe, or you can use it from Lightroom or from Photoshop just as way of review. And so the, that's important to understand that we don't do much from the sharpening and the uh, noise reduction. That's the key thing that we wanted to cement that Arvid was uh, speaking about. So let's just review for those who might be new. Then I will go here. And the first thing I'm going to do, and another question I received was, you know, why do you do it first? Because you really want to reduce noise early on in the workflow, uh, primarily because you don't want to keep enhancing that noise. You want to get rid of it so that you're not enhancing it with anything else you're going to do with your other steps in the workflow. I love this uh, image from Valley of Fire. And look at this. Here's before AI Clear. Here's after. Now, what we didn't talk about yesterday is over here, we do have a little more. Since they upgraded uh, the AI Clear, uh, the major upgrade here, they've given us an auto button and they've asked, or they've allowed us to do rather 
low and high sharpness. So let's go ahead and click high. Let it go through its working. Remember up here, it's going through. This is the status bar, this blue bar up at the top. And because there's a fair bit more math going on right now, it's going to be taking some time to get through all of this. So we'll be patient and we'll finish this. So here we are before, after. Let me bring up this again. So here's before. Let's bring it up to here. Before, after, before, after. Pretty significant change to something we thought was pretty clear, pretty sharp. Okay, just to cement again, when we use, and for those new people joining us today, when we use AI Clear, this is where we definitely want to take advantage of that apply button. Because if we don't apply, or essentially think about it as flattening your layers, we're going to have this AI clear reprocessing each time we do something new. So this would be a good time to hit the apply button, let it go through and create a clean image. Now this, uh, well, where did it go? Oh, there it is, good. So uh, I got a little confused because it's over here. So there's the one we started with. It has the AI clear in the adjustment list over here, whereas this one has the AI clear applied to it. But now it's not going to recalculate every time. Now we can start to build here. Now, let me go back to, let's think here. Let's go back here. Let, let's say that we did, um, to answer Arvid's next question, and some of you also might have that, let's say we come into here like we did yesterday, and we do John start and we add precision contrast. And then let's say we come in here and we do a brightness contrast and we just do a few things with layers. Let's say we would like to save all these layers so that we can open this up much like a PSD file from Photoshop. In Photoshop, we can have two, five, 10, 150 layers. And if we save that as a PSD file, we can go back and work on that later. Well, you see Marin here. Marin's a horse image I was will be working on today. But what we would do is we go here and we go up to the top. Let me get my magnifier again. We'll come up here to the top where it says Topaz Studio. We'll hit File, and then we will hit Save As or choose Save As. And now we have a file format chooser or pick list, and we have you know the standards that you're very familiar with: JPEG, TIFF, PNG but it's TSP. A TSP is a proprietary file format to the folks at, <clears throat> excuse me, at Topaz. And what that's going to do, I'm not gonna do it right now, but what that's going to do is save your file with all of the layers over here. And you have a choice of where to put that. So you could bring over, open your regular browser, put it in the file folder where you wanna put it. And now when you open that up again, only from, it's only readable by Topaz Studio. Okay, so make sure that you reopen it in Topaz Studio, but when you do, you'll have all of your layers intact on the right side and can continue or edit or modify what you've done before. So big deal, a lot of, a lot of people don't really know that that exists. It's not something we speak about a lot, but this is a pretty savvy group, so good questions. Okay, next, um, <clears throat> let's do D Hayes, my good friend, Ed out in Bellevue, Washington, a wonderful guy. Um, he said, John, you didn't cover, you know, Topaz D. Hayes. Or, will you do that uh, tomorrow? I said, you bet. You know, we didn't have time. I thought from the feedback, I guess the pace was really good though, covering things a little more slowly and in more depth. So let's maybe cover a few things here. Uh, Cause my friend Linda was asking, could you maybe slow down just a little bit and redo uh, the idea about copy and pasting a mask? So we'll do two of those things with this new image today. So we're going to answer Ed's question about dehaze and then Linda's request to go back, slow down a little bit on the copy and pasting of a mask, because that's really important. Understanding masks and how they work can really be helpful in your workflow. So let's do that. So here we are. I've brought an image in that has, again, very little bit. Let me go back, just so everybody's on the same page here. Uh, go back to the raw file. That's not the one I want. Whoops. I think I just went sliding by it here. Let, you know what? Let me go back to the grid view. It's a lot easier to see. 
Okay, there's my raw file. So you'll see when I go into the develop module, <clears throat> I've not done very much. I've turned the sharpening off, noise reduction off. In the basic panel, I've gone through, oh, what am I, I must be looking at a TIFF, that's why. Yeah, that helps, there's my raw file. Over here, I think I need to turn the detail off. There we go. So I'll do turn that off. In the basic panel, uh, I've done very little. I've set a white point, I've set a black point. I've changed my white balance. That's really all I've done on this image thus far. As I said yesterday, the reason I don't use this presence panel is I believe that the precision contrast is light years better than clarity. And I really believe dehaze is, I mean, more than light years ahead. It's really tremendous uh, piece of software. So I prefer not to use these and I, I go and finish my steps here in studio. <clears throat> Okay, so the first thing I will do, typically, just to continue the workflow, is go ahead and apply AI Clear. It's just what I do. It's become my habit now, and it's my workflow, because I just really am blown away with the results from this product. So let's see what it does on this image, because I honestly don't know. Okay, before and after. Let's look at this. I think I'll bring up the this again. So here's before. Look at the noise up in the above the Whitman County growers and look at the detail in those grain bins. Now look at the detail and look at the noise that's gone above there. It's really tremendous. Okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to apply that because we don't want to have that recalculating every time. And now I'm working on the applied image. How do I know it's the applied image? Because I don't see the AI clear layer here anymore. And remember, we spoke yesterday, if I want to automatically be sent to that, I go up to my top left here, to studio, to preferences, and I turn this on right here where it says switch to new image after applying image. So that helps me to automatically have the blue frame around the active image and we know it's the applied image we're working on. Okay, step number one. Now let's go ahead and go to dehaze, another one of my absolute favorites. Why is a favorite? Why do I like this so much better than Adobe's? Well, I don't know if you've noticed, but when you work with Adobe and you start pushing that slider this aggressively to the right, the colors get really wonky, really wonky, really fast. Here, the colors stay really true. They're beautiful and it helps me get rid of the, uh, the haze. Now, just a couple of thoughts on using this tool properly in my mind. You know, haze exists in landscape photography, so I'm not sure you always want to get rid of it completely because it doesn't look real natural in my mind. Um, that said, let's, again, in teaching, I like to overdo things so that you can see them. So that's why I wanted to preface this by saying I think you should be careful, but just to teach these concepts of masking and dehaze, we're gonna overdo it a little bit. I'm not looking at the foreground of this image. It looks really great. I have no problems with that, but I'd like to get rid of some of that haze in the background. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring this over quite significantly. It's way overdone in the foreground, but it's done a pretty good job here. So how do I make sure that I don't have that happening in the foreground. I'm gonna go here, and again, here's what I'm looking at. This is the dehaze layer that I'm looking at only. And as I look to the right of the word dehaze, I have a box with a plus, that is my mask. Here's how I turn that adjustment on and off. Here's how I can do some other things in the menu, and I can either throw away that layer if I want to. So I wanna go ahead and click the, the mask at this point. And now what I have is a number of tools that I can use to mask with. I can use a brush. I can use a spot tool. I can think about that as a radial brush, if you're thinking about Adobe language. The grad filter. You can mask based on color and or luminosity. Think about that. So with color, if you have a specific area, you know, that's blue, blue sky, and you only want to work on that, you can choose your mask based on that color. We're not going to do that here. We're going to use the grad. So how does this work real quickly? Something really important, it'll drive you crazy if you use others' grads. You have to click where there's a hand. 
watch. If I click on this and there's not a hand, it gets all wonky. That's why that happens. I'm sure every I'm sure there's a bunch out there going, oh man, that's exactly what happens to me. Well, it's because you're not making sure there's a hand inside that box. Now I can pull these apart. Or if I go in the middle one, I can move it up and down with the white one. So just by way of review, from the green below is everything that's receiving the adjustment. From the red above is not receiving the adjustment. Anywhere in between the green and the red is a feathered uh, area. So in this case, we want the top to receive the adjustment. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna grab this, spin it around, and make sure the top, so anything from the green and above, is receiving the dehaze adjustment. Anything from the red and below is not. Anything from the red to the green is a zero to a 100% feather that's being created. Now I can place that wherever I want to by grabbing the hand inside of that white box. I think somewhere right about here makes sense. Okay, so remember, we can go back to the word dehaze and click on that. And now here's that strength slider. So now we can push that strength slider a little bit more now that we're looking just at that top area and say, great, that's maybe a little more than I want to. So, but it, I like going a little further than I was. And by just masking the area that I want to be putting this in, it gives me a lot better visual understanding of what's happening there. So there's that. Now to go to Linda's question, how do we then maybe add a little bit of clarity in just the foreground? Well, we can use those same steps, but let's, let's not clarity, I should say dehaze. Let's say we wanna add a little dehaze just in the foreground. Well, let's show you a technique, and I think this is a what Linda was talking about. When I have the mask open, now I have the same tools here, See next to dehaze, we had this that opens the mask and so forth. Now next to the word mask, I can turn the mask on and off. I can invert that mask. Or let's see what this drop down uh, hamburger menu does for us. Well, if we look at that, I can copy this mask. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna go ahead and copy that before I open up another dehaze layer. So now let's open up this next dehaze layer. And in this case, I'm not gonna be paying attention to the top of this image. I'm only paying attention to the bottom of the image. And I know the amount of dehaze I'm gonna apply down here is gonna be much less. Look, it's about a third of what we were doing for the top. So how can we click quickly mask this? And more importantly, how do we make that mask the exact opposite of what we used at the top. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Because then we know we've blended those two together perfectly. So here's what we do. Remember what we're gonna do is this is the second. Here's the top one, that was the first dehaze layer. The second one is this new one we're working on the foreground, but it's affecting, if we click the mask, it's affecting white reveals, black conceals in a mask. So when we see all this white, it's revealing and it's telling us that that this dehaze adjustment, the second one, is being applied to the entire image. But I wanna put a mask and the black is gonna reveal, I'm sorry, conceal. So here's what I'm gonna do. Remember this same menu here next to the word mask is the same hamburger menu. I'm gonna click on that. And I'm gonna say paste the mask. Okay, that's all well and good, but what's wrong with this right now? It's, it's masking, the, it's putting the identical mask that we did for the first one. So it's basically added to the same area that we've already masked. We don't wanna do that. We want to invert this mask. So I'm gonna come in here and now this little icon is the invert icon. If I do that, it just flipped the mask upside down. And more importantly, everywhere that was transitioned in between before, in between that green and red, is perfectly transitioned the other direction. Hope that makes sense and hopefully that helped Linda. So the copy and paste happens by choosing it from next to the word mask. The hamburger menu is where you'll always find the copy and paste choices. And then just remember that invert mask is really handy for doing this. Imagine you're selecting the horse, you know, with Marin here, we just do that. And we wanna work on the horse only. Well, I can mask the horse nicely but then I wanna work on the background only. 
you would do the same thing. You would copy and paste that mask and then invert it so that you're working on everything behind the horse and Marin on the horse and you flip it again and now you're working on just the horse itself. So really useful, masking is huge. It's really useful and helpful as you're crafting your images. Okay, so Ed D. Hayes, how to save layers, we did that. Um, oh, somebody asked about edge aware, so let's go back. Um, because I went pretty quickly on that. How do I want to do this? Um, I think maybe it'd be best on this. So let's uh, let's say that we wanted to do precision contrast on on this scene, and we'll just pick my John start and maybe make it a little more aggressive than that. So we've added precision contrast before, after. Look how great that is on the horse, right? It's done a great job on Marin and the horse. It's kind of going in there. Let me press this. So before, after, before, after. However, we say we'd really like to just mask out the horse in this case. So what do we do? Same thing as we've done on other ones. I'm gonna come up here next to precision contrast, click on the X, bring open the mask. And in this case, I'm gonna get a brush. Okay. It's a couple more tips today to build on what we did yesterday. Remember, black conceals, white reveals. How do we choose that? Here is where we do that. So if I click on white, it gives me a white brush. If I paint in here, the bright, nothing's gonna happen. Look, it stays white in my mask. If I paint with black, I, I come over here. Whoops, I should use the magnifier, I apologize. Come over here and I click on this square, which is the black square. Now I have a black brush. Now if I start painting, look, now I can see the, the horse's nose here. Let's, let's be, make sure we understand exactly what's happening. Notice I have an inside circle that's red and outside circle that's green. In order to make this bigger and smaller, I can come over here and I can pull this with my radius tool. A little tip though is I can use the bracket keys next to the letter P on my keyboard, but in order to do that in a Topaz product, I need to at least click on this button over here where the radius is. So over here, again, I'm in the mask and I'm using a brush and here's the tools or the properties of that brush rather. I can make that brush harder or softer or I can click. So once I click, on this word radius. Now look, I can make that brush bigger or smaller. Here's the key to masking and here's the key to edge aware masking. I wanna keep that red circle and I don't wanna go outside the area of the horse, but it's okay to have the green circle outside of the area of the horse. And then as long as I have edge aware turned on, and that is right here on the right side. So again, this is the properties of my brush, the radius softness and edge aware on. What that's going to do is it's going to calculate between the red circle and the green circle and do its best job. And again, this is another area, I hate to keep saying this, but it's true, it's why I love Topaz. It's got the best edge aware technology out there. So it's going to calculate and determine what's what you're really looking for between the inside red circle and the outside green circle. So as I paint with this and making sure not to go, whoops, I just went up there a little bit. Let me turn this off. It makes that hard to do, honestly. I'm gonna keep painting in this horse. And here I can make that brush a little bigger to make sure I'm getting all of this in the middle. I'm making sure not to take that red outside of the horse though, right? Make that a little smaller again as I come down to this part of the horse. Smaller yet to do the legs. Uh, I don't want to take a lot of time doing this masking, so I'm being pretty sloppy in, in the essence of time. But you'll see over here that we're starting to have a mask that looks pretty much like a horse. And that's what we should have here, actually. We should have something that looks like a horse, and there's the tail. And now what we've done is we've masked out that adjustments, remember black conceals, white reveals. And so this precision contrast adjustment, and if I wanna get back to that, I can click on precision contrast, open it up again. Now I'm back to these sliders and notice it's only affecting what's going on in the background. It's not affecting what's going on around that horse right now. And just by way of cementing, cause that's what I like to do. If we do now wanna work on the horse, what am I gonna do? Go up and open up by clicking on the mask, come down to these tools next to the mask, 
copy the mask. Now I'm gonna go up to another adjustment layer. I'm gonna do precision contrast again. Now I'm gonna hit the mask, go to the word mask next to it. I'm gonna put the mask in there. And then right next to the word mask, I'm gonna hit the invert. Now I'm gonna be working on white reveals. Now I'm gonna work on just the, uh, the horse. Now I can go into my John start and I can start to work on just the horse and bring out whatever I want there. So hopefully that has cemented the, the issues or, the, or how to use it would probably be a better way to put it, how to use the, the copy and pasting in the mask area. Okay, so let's, uh, so if we've done this, um, I think we will take the time. So I'm gonna go ahead and go to something a little more um, advanced because I, I sense like this is a, a group that gets it. Uh, if you're all coming back a second time, that's a good sign. So let's say that we wanted to do a better job with this mask. Well, you don't, there are some tools from Topaz that have not made it into the suite yet, into the studio yet. However, we can still get those. So if you have purchased, for instance, Remask, or you've purchased black and white effects, up at the top, you can go find those still. You're going to go up to plugins, and there are all the plugins that you purchased before. So we can go up here and we can go get Topaz Remask. Well, by opening up Remask here, it allows us to make a much more solid mask. I'm going to do this very quickly. Again, I'm concerned about time. Essentially, the way this works is it comes in green. Green is everything you're going to save. And then we need to paint with blue. So we get a brush, a blue brush here. And we can make that brush bigger and smaller again with those bracket keys. And we're just going to very quickly go through this and paint around the edges. And again, you can see how sloppy I'm being. It gets a little more difficult around these feet. So just bear with me to do this. And what I'm making is something that we call a tri mask. And again, this is crappy. I'm doing a lousy job because of time. You would take a little more time. I would use my tablet mostly is what I would do. I'm gonna cover, oops, I don't wanna do that. That's okay, I'll just kind of keep going here. And I would come around here and I'd go through this tail and I'd come around here and you do this. That's how you use Remask. Now what you have to do is now you've got the blue saying, hey, this is the area that I wanna keep inside of this. So I wanna make Marin green, but now I need to fill red on the outside. So I come here to my fills again on the left side. It says fills and brush up here. I wanna to come to the fill. I wanna hit the red, I'm gonna hit red out here. So now the tri map, tri meaning three colors, red, green, and blue. I wanna keep everything inside of this. I wanna get rid of everything outside of this. The blue says, hey, Topaz, calculate in between the green and the red. And I come over here to the left side where it says compute mask. I choose that and it's going to do its best job to create a mask. Now, I'm not gonna spend time refining this mask. Just know that you can. You can adjust it over here on the left side. You can go back and get your brush and paint with a red and blue or a red brush, whatever you need to do. And you're just gonna tap in certain areas to refine that mask. In this case, I'm just gonna hit okay. This is not a, a webinar on making selections. You can see the selection's terrible in between here and over here. We're just trying to introduce you to how you might use this. Okay, I need to get my notes here because this becomes, I wanna put a motion blur on this. So you mask the, the horse first, right? Now I'm gonna put, I'm gonna go back to the original here and now watch what I'm gonna do. This is really kind of cool. So again, it's a little advanced, but follow me here. I'll go slow. So I'm back to the, I have the masked version here. I have Marin on the horse here. I'm gonna now go up here to the top right where it says image, and I'm gonna create an image file. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go grab down the bottom, I'm gonna grab the masked version of that. And I'm gonna drop that in here. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go down, I'm gonna get motion blur. But look, it's, it's making the motion blur happen on everything. I'm gonna grab the image layer. So right, what I have right now is an image layer, image layer layer, if you will, and a motion, bla motion blur layer. If I just now come and I grab this, and I grab this by just pulling it, 
below, look what happened. So all I did, let's put it back where it was. Maybe you don't know this, but you don't have to have these layers in the position they're in. They are movable. And, I, and where they are matters as to what's being seen above or below that layer. So in this case, I just grab where it says image layer, I pull it below motion blur, and look what I have. I have the horse masked out so I can use that motion blur. So let's take a half a second on motion blur. What do I have here? Some presets like you would normally expect, and then I have different types of blur. Well, for this, I'd like to make it look exactly like something I might be panning, like with cars, I might be panning a car in Cuba. I've done that and showed you those images here before. Um, now I can do that after the fact. So I'm gonna grab this tool here. See this, once I chose motion, this little tool here allows me to say what direction, how much motion do I want to, to create from the motion blur? And again, what direction I want it to be in. So this is a great little tool that you grab onto. And all in this case I would like to do is just add a little bit of motion blur so it takes the background away and we just see Marin riding the horse. Forgive me, again, in the essence of speed here, you can see the snow. This looks terrible right here around the horses, but you can imagine if I spent literally two or three more minutes, we would have seen uh, all of this be perfect, and it would make a big difference as to how this looked. Okay, one more concept here that applies to any layer that you're working on, and this is something I think people forget about, and I can't express how important this is. When you're doing dramatic effects like this, it's best to pull your opacity slider down, or go have a cup of coffee, a soda or something, come back and look at it again. Because especially when you're working on contrast, when you're working on saturation, it's so easy to overdo this stuff. And then you post it on Instagram and Facebook and people are going, whoa, it's oversaturated. It's because we kind of lose track when we're working on things of what reality is. And it's best to look away and come back. But I've taught myself to go to the opacity slider. So any layer we have here on the right side, is going to have an opacity slider associated with it. Well, I would pull that back a little bit, anywhere between 70 and 80%. This says 0 0.7, 0 point, think about that as percentage, 0% all the way to 100%. And matter of fact, I'd love them to change that to be that a percentage or you know, just a whole number. And notice it gets rid of some of that halo that's happening around the horse by pulling that over this way a little bit. And I think it makes it look a little more realistic than heavy handedly putting that in. So think about that for any layer that you're working on. If you're doing dehaze or something, probably not near as necessary, but if you're doing dramatic adjustments, boy, I, bring it back to seven or 8%, trust me, you'll thank me on that because you won't have things that are way over processed. Once again, you don't want in your processing philosophically, you don't want people looking at it and saying, Wow, great job of topaz motion blur, John. That's not what you want. You want to do such a good job that people are going, wow, that's great. That's a great image blur you did there. What shutter speed did you use? You know, That's what you're looking for like you did it in camera. Okay, we're going to run out of time shortly. So let me look at my list. There's a couple things just to get you excited, especially with the, the holiday sale coming up here that's going to make it a no-brainer to, to go get bundles or gift yourself or treat yourself for Christmas or whatever you, with an early present, whatever you're gonna do here. I wanna go in here and just touch base. Oh, and again, I apologize, we really are trying to go slow here, but I do wanna get through, here we are. I wanna just make sure we understand. So for those who are saying, how the heck do I open it? You just right click on an image, edit in, studio we covered that yesterday so again if some of these things you're going hey wait a minute that's a, something i need to know just go back and watch the first part here's where i want to go back and, and make sure that you understand what's going on the left side of the screen here this would be a really good time to use the left part of the screen and remember we have different ways to view this the top left icon is if you had a search going on, there's nothing in there because I don't have anything to search. This is how we have the basic, basic panel that you wanna look at. Well, for those of you who purchased Topaz Effects, or Texture Effects, 
and you're and you're missing that interface well it's really easy all you got to do is come over here on the left side where it says texture effects if i click on that now you're going to have your old friendly uh presets over here that you're familiar with if i click on this again and you want to go find those ethereal presets that you love so much now you can find them over here okay same thing for um, let's go up here to impression. If I want my old impression workflow, I can go click on the word impression. Now the very top one over here says impression workflow. What that means is over here, let me close this one up. Over here on the right side, it's automatically gonna put impression over here on the right side for you. You don't even have to go get it from here. It's gonna put that tool there. But more importantly, it's going to list all of the impression related presets on the left side. And I would go here and I would go even further beyond that. I love the painting effects that have been created by the folks back at Topaz. So now I can go to impression as my root folder, go to the painting subfolder, and now I have all my friends over here that I love so much on the left side and I can scroll through those and say, ah, there's my favorite old Georgia O'Keeffe. And I can find that real quickly and apply that, which I adore. So let's spend just a couple of seconds here as we finish up today and, and help you understand what's going on over here. There's a lot going on on the right side. I wish I had like some of these other tools that we're working on, I wish I could be more um, uh, explicit in, in what's going on here. Here's what I can tell you. You're going to have to just play. Just know that you do have some presets that you can use. Know that all of the things that I've been speaking about with regard to masking right here, turning this layer on and off is right here, and then doing things from this menu, which is copying and duplicating, or if I do add a mask, I can copy and paste with that mask if I want to. And then, believe it or not, these, these brushes make a huge difference. So right now, the brush being used is the one that has this around it. Let's take a look at this brush and see how it affects, it makes a dramatic effect. So you might begin by changing the brush and seeing how you feel about the effect there. There's all sorts of brushes here to choose and get different effects from. The next thing you might wanna do just to make this easier is the paint volume has a significant impact. If I bring paint volume way down, it changes things reasonably uh, uh, dramatically. If I use a brush size, that's gonna have a major effect, right? So those are things. And then a paint opacity is, is a major one. So those are the ones I would start to play with. These stroke rotations, um, uh, rotation variation, all those things get to be, you know, things that you could play with, but maybe not near as critical. The smudge has a major effect depending on which image is being used and how they're working in conjunction with the other tools and the amount of coverage and the transitions. So these things are, I would um, play with and then you do have, you know, colors that you can work with, lighting that you can change, and texture. But I'm not, I'm not going to spend a lot more time than th these are the main things. I wanted to get you at least a basic understanding primarily of how do you find those old friends, those presets that we fell in love with so much so that we can just click on them and get those working for us right away. And then how do we then modify these we go over to the right side and modify those things that have been there. Same thing as if we go back here real quickly and I've got a few minutes and then we'll leave more time. I created this real quickly from this. And so let's just do that to finish up with, and I'll say this as we, whoops, what did I do? I don't wanna open that up there, my bad. See that I try to go too fast, let's go back here. Right click, edit in Topaz Studio. As this is opening up, uh, what I wanna uh, point out is texture effects is a playground. It's a party, it's a box full of new crayons as my buddy Jack says. It really is a blast. And so I have two hour long videos or webinar videos that you can go find in the archives in the Topaz website if this tickles your fancy a little bit. So once again, let's do this quickly. 
um, because you guys are experts now. So I would go over to texture effects and whoop, why did that not invoke? Let's do that again. Texture effects, and it would bring open these things, and we could go find really cool effects if we wanted to, and we can find some really neat things. We really can, and that's what makes this really fun is you can have great success right away, or I can come over to the right side, way down to the bottom. I'm going to hit that little backwards arrow. I'm going to zero everything out and just show you quickly how you can use this tool to start creating your own. So I'm going to go to adjustments here. And I would probably do a basic adjustment because I want to brighten this up as much as I can. Let me stop and just tell you real quickly what's going on here. Why is this tool so much better than others? Well, what Topaz is doing with this exposure, so you'll notice I can push this really hard, but look at the histogram up here. It's raining in your raining you in from blowing out your highlights. So you can really open up the exposure on this a lot and not blow out those highlights, which is really great. Whereas other times when you're hitting the exposure slider, you're gonna have a peak of information on the right side and blown out uh, pixels and you don't wanna do that. So this helps me to get a nice bright image to do the texture work on. I just know I'm gonna need that. So now I'll just go into texture. So I open up my adjustments. And again, this is one of the pro shop adjustments. So you have to pay for this one. Here we are. So we open up texture effects. And now all I have, well, I shouldn't say texture effects, a texture layer. Now we can go look at what textures are. And what I love about this is how responsive this is. Let's go in here and in categories, I've added some of my own textures and I love flypaper textures. So let's go into flypaper. Uh, we can talk about how to get those in in a different time. And again, I would encourage you to go watch my two webinars and you'll know exactly how to add those uh, flypaper textures. But I just love this texture. I love this texture. I just like that amber look. So I'm going to choose that. I'm going to scroll down here to the bottom where it says opacity. And, and I'm sorry, opacity. And next to it is what we call a blending mode. Well, what I like to do is change that blending mode to multiply. I like what that does. It gives me a slightly different look. I'm gonna also come down to the, that in this mode and I'm gonna bring that opacity up a little bit. So just quickly, I was, and then by the way, you should know that all of these right here, so remember, I'm looking at a texture layer. See right here, it says texture. And everything underneath this, is how I can affect the texture. So this brightness, this contrast, this detail, this saturation apply just to the texture now, not to what's behind it, not to the image itself. So if you wanted to adjust that texture and add some contrast, you could do that. Or if you wanted to bring out the detail in that, you could. I'm not gonna do that. I just want you to be aware that these tools relate to the texture itself, not to the background. Okay. What I want you to know just as we wrap things up now is you can add as many things as you want to. So let's add another adjustment layer, another texture layer. And on, in this case, let's go to Topaz and let's go to my good friend, Kathleen Clemens, who's just a sweetie pie and she's a real artist and she's created these great textures. They're awesome. She just came out with another new set. And so I love what this does, but I don't want it on the whole image here. So once again, I pick and notice I can scroll over all of these and get the different looks that her textures might give me. But I just love what this is going to do. Let me show you when I'm going to do this. I'm going to go back down here and I'm going to come down to multiply again. See what I love about this is it's create. What, what did I do? Did I hit? I don't want, maybe I didn't want multiply. Hang on. I want to be, yeah, no multiply or maybe we did soft light here. Over. Nope, I think I did do multiply. Multiply here. And what it does is it creates this stormy, unfortunately, you know what the inspiration of this is all those horrific fires going on in California. And when I looked at this, it gave me a feeling and, you know, images really should have feelings of what's going on out there and the devastation. And my heart is just full for those people uh, and what's going on out there. So I hit multiply, bring this up a little bit. And then guess what? I can come up here and I can go to the mask area and I can get that grad mask and I can come in here and I can just have, uh, am I on the right? Nope, I'm on the right one. And I can have this go this way. I want this to be up above 
and I can have two-tone colors, or I can just have this blend right through there. And whoops, see that? I did just what I told you not to do. You got to have the hand in there. And now I can have that one just really smoothly coming through here and gradually going through this area if that's what I want it to do. So anyways, that's all I want to do for today. We've covered, hopefully we've reinforced some things that we spoke about yesterday and really made some of these basic things that are so important to slow down and cover make a lot of sense. And hopefully we've added just a few more ideas at the end of today. Cool. Uh, I don't really have any other questions. I appreciate everybody showing up, sticking around. Uh, we had, uh, I think we got to like 13 or 1400 today. I didn't actually see it when it beat. Right. I think so too. Yep. It's another awesome. good day. Yep. And we'll have to do one of these two days again. This is a lot of fun. I really like having you around. I'm getting emails right now. I think that's what we'll do the next time, folks, and maybe even in December. Awesome. Cool. Well, I will reach out to you about that then. And everybody, good. thank you again so much for sticking around. And we hope you have a good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are around the world. Great. And happy holidays if you're in the States. Yep. Take care.